A doctor is now accused of drugging and sexually assaulting multiple women he met on dating apps. Criminal defense attorney Kathleen Bogenschutz comes on to get into the details of the state's case and a potential defense. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law & Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. We have to talk about the story of Dr. Stephen Matthews. Okay, so he's a 35-year-old cardiologist out of Colorado, and he is accused of drugging and sexually abusing multiple women that he met on dating apps. I'm going to give you a timeline of this. So back in March, Matthews was charged with three counts of sexual assault of a woman he met on Hinge, which is a popular dating app. And she claims after a brunch where the two drank, they went back to his place, they hung out in his hot tub, And then she blacks out. She doesn't remember what happened. She comes to about 10 hours later with hickeys on her chest and doesn't remember having any kind of sexual encounter with him. Then she said that when she didn't meet up with him for another date, he sent her nude photos of herself, revenge porn. While he told police that this was a sexual, a consensual sexual encounter, he was ultimately arrested. Okay? So now he's got a preliminary hearing in this case a few days ago, you know, basically to see if there's enough evidence to go forward with trial. And as he's waiting outside of the courtroom, he is arrested again for now allegedly raping nine more women. And he was hit with 13 more sexual assault charges, ranging from no consent to drugging to the victim being in a helpless condition. So much to talk about here. So let me bring in Kathleen Bogenschutz, criminal defense attorney who's been on the program before. Kathleen, it's great to have you on here. I don't even know where to start first. I'll first start with him being arrested outside of court. Have you ever seen anything like that? Yeah. Yeah, I have. Um, so your viewers who might not be law enforcement or prosecutors or, or something in that ilk, I mean, it's really common to arrest somebody outside of court because you know where they're going to be right? You don't need to track them down. You know, they're going to be from uh, be away from any weapons. They've got to go through security. And like, there's a date and a time they need to be there. It's a great way to arrest somebody and not put any law enforcement at risk. Well, his attorney said this was nothing more than a public spectacle. He said it's something that they did not have to do. They had him arrested right in the hallway. That was not necessary for public safety or any other reason than to create a public spectacle. What's your comments on that? I mean, ugh. They're going to argue what they're going to argue. Uh, I always liked to arrest people at court because I knew they had gone through uh, the metal detectors. I knew that it wasn't going to be a big scene. I knew that the cops wouldn't have to worry about family members at the house controlling the scene, those kinds of things. So in my opinion, and at least when I was a prosecutor, I used to encourage cops to do that. Now, in this mm. case, it's high profile, so the media was there which is okay, I'm well, assuming what he's well, complaining about. Yeah, they, they were yeah. watching him. They were they had the yeah. tape on him, and then his family, I think, was there as well. I want to talk to you about what goes into prosecuting a case like this. Now, some of the victims did seek medical help, and there appears to be documentation after these alleged incidents, which I imagine is going to be a prosecutor's dream. Walk me through what is going to go into prosecuting this man for all of these alleged different crimes. So the first thing that comes to mind is dates and times because you've got statutes limitations a lot of times on adult victims. Um, These are all relatively recently. I think the earliest one that I saw was dated in 2019. So you are likely fine on that. And then you've got so many substantial similarities. Our practice was always to file the cases separately and then file a motion to, in Florida, it's called Williams Rule. In other states, it's called 404B evidence, uh, but to bring in those other cases to show that there's a pattern of conduct, um, a common scheme or plan, uh, the fact, I mean, some of these cases are like, they're like fingerprints. Uh, you meet on a dating app that you gave them to, even down to the drinks, tequila, mimosas, the hot tub was involved. They were playing Jenga back at his apartment. I mean, it's, it is like cookie cutter crimes here. Do you think that it's necessary for all of these alleged victims to testify against him in order to prove the case? Because I'm almost reminded in a way, very, very, very different case. But we covered the Zachary Wester trial where that was a police officer that planted drugs in people's cars. And I can't even tell you how many people testified against him um, about what what happened to them. And it makes me wonder, is this going to be a case where all of them are necessary to come forward and testify about what happened to them? So, you know, one of the lawyers at my firm actually defended Mr. Wester 
it's a, it's a couple counties west of here. Uh, but uh, well, in yeah, terms of a I conflict mean, of interest, I won't ask you about that case. It I'll, was just I'll comment on the other cases. Correct. Yeah, just yes. to say, I'm not going to comment on Wester. Fair, but, fair. Um, uh, as far as Williams rule or 404B evidence, you're far more likely to get a case reversed on that if you're a prosecutor uh, than pretty much any other thing. So you want to be very careful. You want to pick and choose your best cases, your most similar cases, and not do too much. You, you can't make it what's called a feature of the case. So uh, in cases where I used to use it, um, I would be extremely careful. Uh, like you would put the other victim on the, the, the stand and say, did he touch you? Yes, where? Yes, and get him off within 15 minutes. Like you don't, Re really, you don't make a really, big deal out of it. Is that because the, the concern is that if they're, the testimony of one of these alleged victims is maybe not as strong as the other, that could jeopardize the whole case? Yes, and, and then you've also got the factor that at least in my jurisdiction, if you prosecute one individual case and you use Williams rule to help convict case number one, um, if you go forward on that second case that you utilized as part of Williams rule, and that case is lost, it becomes an appellate issue in case one. So you have to mm. sit down with all the victims and you need to be strategic about what cases you're trying at the same time. So, so you're saying there is a possibility that they won't all try one trial, one jury deciding all of these counts. They might separate them. Yes, that's okay. that's what I think is the safest thing to do. And I think that you pick your best cases for Williams rule. Um, the fact is that uh, there are a couple of cases where it seems like one of the girls that were young women who was brought over to his apartment suddenly realized that, oh, my gosh, this is the same guy that raped my friend three years ago. And I, I saw that in one of the. Uh, in one of the police reports and that one i i'm not quite sure what to do with that as far as williams rule because she obviously heard about it from a friend of hers prior to it so maybe not use that one the the role of him being a doctor a cardiologist aside from the fact that the headline is chilling to think about a a, a member of the medical profession someone who's supposed to care for people and help people is accused of actually assaulting and abusing them the fact that he was a, a man of medicine, how do you think that's going to play into this? Because my first thought is, if he really did drug them, there would, that's a knowledge base on how to subdue them and what happens to the human body. Oh, sure. I mean, it wouldn't shock me to, to find out there's subpoenas and search warrants flying for all of his DEA history for the past five or six years uh, to see if there's any sort of uh, change in what he's prescribing. Uh, it didn't mention whether he's surgical or uh, interventional, I guess, as a cardiologist, and what, what things he might have access to at his practice. So it might be different depending on what type of cardiology he practices, but I'll bet you anything that they're looking into supplies at the office and whether inventory matches what they have in the cabinets and uh, what you could possibly give to somebody, it seems like orally, uh, because they're all alleging that it was uh, potentially after a drink they had. Yeah, ingested. Um, by the way, at the time of this recording, I'll let everybody know, he apparently still has his medical license, not facing any kind of discipline act, disciplinary action in the medical field. Obviously, he's facing criminal charges. I wouldn't be surprised if that ultimately changes moving forward. We'll continue to monitor that. I do want to talk about his defense a little bit. So his attorney, uh, Doug Cohen, aside from you know t saying that it was wrong for police to ultimately arrest him outside of court, he came out and said, quote, the case is about two adults who, like many folks these days, met online and had consensual sex on their first date. Unfortunately, that lifestyle can result in buyer's remorse, jilted lovers and tall tales, but it is not a crime. The attorney also said that the government had no forensic medical evidence to prove the accuser was too impaired to consent. We will defend him to the fullest. Your thoughts on that statement? Well, I'm assuming he made that statement when there was only one accuser, because I think that's what it right. sounds like from what you said. And that's that's part of the thing that makes uh, 404B evidence so powerful in court. Um, you can almost get to a point where the jury's looking at it logically and saying, OK, how many times is lightning going to strike one guy? Um, well, if all well, these girls the, have the, similar. The, the, the counter argument to that would be is very similar to what we heard in other high profile sexual assault cases that as soon as one person comes forward and it becomes publicized, there could be people coming out of the woodwork to say, oh, the same thing happened to me and it's not true. 
I don't know if that, I mean, that seems like a little bit of a stretch here because it's not like he, um, just a devil's advocate, it's not like he's a major celebrity or a billionaire and everybody's trying to get payouts. I don't understand what the incentive would be for some, for one of these victims to come out and say that they were sexually assaulted when they weren't. But I'm just playing devil's advocate about I, what a potential defense could be. Well, and, and and another thing that you would do, especially if you're going to, you know that the, the media is going to release this story um, as a prosecutor, as a police officer, as a detective, what you would do is hold back some facts. You wouldn't give them all the facts in this. Um, and uh, one would keep all the victims away from each other so nobody could try to say, well, they all got in a room together while they were waiting to testify and got their story straight. So, um, I, I, and it's unfortunate for victims who are, uh, have, you know, common offenders that you can't let them support each other, but you have to protect the case first. Kathleen Bogenschutz, what a case. Thank you so much for coming on. Appreciate you taking the time. And uh, let's continue to follow this and see where it progresses. Appreciate it, Kathleen. Thanks so much for having me. And that's all we have for you here on Sidebar, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. I'll speak to you next time.